Hello, everyone. Although over a screen, I am happy to be able to worship with all of you today. While we are all in different locations, we would like to be able to worship the Lord from our hearts together. So please be aware of the following five requests for online worship. Before playing the worship service recording, allow time to prepare your heart. Remove anything that will distract you. Even though the service is held over a screen, it is still to worship the Lord God. Please worship with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I recommend turning off your TV or cell phone or anything else that may distract you from worship. Let's put our hearts together to sing worship songs and pray. Have a Bible on hand. Give an offering. During the worship service, there is time to give an offering. Please set aside an offering at that time. You can bring the offering money that you collected to the church when we are able to start regular services again, or bring it to the church on a weekday between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock, or on a Saturday or Sunday between 10 o'clock and 12.30. The church staff will be there to accept it. It is also possible to transfer your offering to the church's postal Yucho bank account, as well as via line pay. Let's begin the service. Now I'll read today's Bible passage. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, The Lord has forgiven, forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Your children hasten back and those who laid you waste depart from you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them all as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people and those who devoured you will be far away. The child, children born during your bereavement will yet say in your hearing, this place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. Please allow me to pray. God says he always is with us and that he holds tightly into our right hand. Dear God, it's been about a month now of having to stay inside and not being able to have joint uh, worship services. However, we're able to read the Bible at our homes and sing out praises to you and to worship you. But it still seems that something's missing or something's insufficient. That's what our spirit calls out. As you say in your word, Lord, just as some people do, yeah, God, you tell us in your word not to give up uh, worshiping together. You instruct us to worship together and that we are blessed because of it. And now we can really get a sense of that. 
Lord, we are confident that such a day will return. We also know, Lord, that your right hand holds on to us tightly and supports us and provides gardens for us. We're so thankful. Dear Lord, please allow us to be uh, watching over our beloved friends, Lord, and uh, allow them to be able to worship with us together one day to, in the future. Allow each person to be able to grow in the meantime and to really be able to spend time with you, Lord, one-on-one -on -one while we're in this situation. Lord, allow us to be able to be able to share you with others. We put everything before you. Pray in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? May 10th is Mother's Day. And through the internet, we're happy to be able to worship, uh, to be able to celebrate Mother's Day with you. There's a kind of a mochi or rice cake, and if you'd like draw a picture of it, you know, no matter how good the picture is, it's not going to fill you up because you can't eat it. So there, it seems like kind of a waste to draw something so beautiful if you can't even eat it. However, if you drew this picture of a uh, mochi, or and it was a work of Van Gogh, then it might be worth like just several billion yen. And with that amount of money, you'd be able to buy <laughs> enough bread or rice cakes <laughs> to feed just thousands of people. So basically, the value of uh, something depends on how whose hand made it. The Bible states that the person, the being responsible for creating us, is God, and we are works of God, and because of that, we are valuable. God Himself has declared that we are precious in His eye, in His sight. However. If you uh, think about Van Gogh again, before he actually became a painter, he was actually uh, an ev evangelist. Did you know that? His uh, grandfather and his father were both pastors. And that's why he had the desire also to become a pastor, and that's what he told the church. However, he really wasn't good at speaking like being a public speaker, and his personality wasn't the greatest for being able to work together with others either. So the church uh, just actually denied his request for him to become a pastor, but he didn't give up. He, he was, he was con you know, convinced that that was what God had in store for him. So the church was kind of uh, thinking about a way that he could, like, you know, learn about evangelism. So they sent him off to a Belgium coal mine and told him to just gain experience uh, evangelizing there and then come back to the church. However, the words that he used to speak to people just didn't really, you know, have an impact on these coal mine workers. And these coal mine workers were like, oh, some evangelists come and they just, just totally ignored him. In the coal mine, though, uh, there was a labor dispute that arose, and a strike occurred, and they were demanding that they, their wages be raised. So Van Gogh was wanting to you know, gain a sense of solar, uh, solidarity with these um, coal mine workers, and so he participated in the strike. But when this was found out about by the people related to him, and then that was reported to the church, uh, Van Gogh was actually called out by the church and said, like, ask, what are you doing? Why are you participating in a labor dispute? You shouldn't be doing something like that. Your whole purpose of going to the coal mine is to be an evangelist. However, he wasn't able to defend himself uh, sufficiently. So the result of this was that he actually lost his job there. 
he uh, then had to go for his second choice in occupation, which was actually become a, a painter. During his work, he made about uh, his lifetime, he made about 800 works, but only one of them was sold during his lifetime. And it was actually his uh, younger brother who brought it, who bought it, named Theo. After he died was actually when his works uh, received a prize. So when Van Gogh was working in the coal mine, he has, um, sent over like 100 letters to his younger brother, Theo, and some of these letters have been translated into Japanese as well. The content of the letters includes about how Van Gogh was, even though he was a, like a, a painter, he was also a philosopher. The coal mine workers you know, we're working in a very uh, dark place underground and their clothing would just get dirty immediately. However, they didn't have enough money to be able to buy new clothing f for work and so they would just use whatever was on hand there. So they would use like these hemp bags uh, for materials there and and use that for clothing. And y sometimes these hemp bags have the words handle with care on it. And they would take these hemp bags and uh, cut holes in for their arms and head and so on and use this as clothing to work in the coal mines. When Van Gogh saw these people wearing these hemp bags and saw that it said handle with care on them, he really uh, began to think and he thought, wow, you know, humans really are something that is broken, so they must be handled carefully. They must be regarded in a more careful manner. And that's what he, his conclusion was when seeing this. It was really something that a philosopher would think of. And he also uh, wrote many things that uh, were very biblical in his letters. When Van Gogh looked at humans, he realized that they truly were broken and that they regarded caution when uh, being uh, handled. So in God's eyes, though, how does God see us? I mean, that's how Van Gogh saw people, but how does God see us? In today's passage, which was actually for Isaiah 49, uh, verses 13 through 20, verse 15 says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. So Isaiah was a prophet, and he lived around uh, 700 B.C. At that time, he was speaking to the Israel, Israeli people, and God was speaking to them through him. He was declaring that through the descendants of Abraham, we would be saved uh, in Jesus Christ. We humans are people who are dealing now with an IT revolution and AI, artificial intelligence, and developing various uh, disease treatment for incurable diseases and so on. However, regardless of how much humans progress in the world, we are just a small, tiny little speck uh, as seen by God. And... God uh, sees us as a little baby in which we are so fragile that we can't live without proper care. When a premature baby is born, they have to be put into an incubator in order to live. As for us humans, we have to be, or actually we kind of live in an incubator type uh, environment, which is this world. Everything that is needed for humans to live is prepared and for us on this work, uh, this globe. And it's just exactly like someone designed this incubator type space for us to be able to live. In outer space, there is no air. However, around the Earth, there is the atmosphere and there's oxygen, and, and we are able to breathe in this oxygen to live. However, Humans can't live just on oxygen. If there was no atmospheric pressure, then we wouldn't be able to uh, live. To 
breathe, it actually means it's like the phenomenon of oxygen in the atmosphere dissolving into blood by penetrating our, the cell film in our uh, air sacs in our lungs. So if there is no atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, then oxygen won't be able to be able to penetrate in our bodies. If you go up on a high elevation mountain, you can hear people often say the air is thin. And if you look at this from a scientific way, it, it's not that it's any different necessarily in density, but it's because the atmospheric pressure is quite different. It isn't sufficient to be able to provide enough uh, oxygen to our lungs at a high height. On just more normal surfaces, the one atmospheric pressure is about 760 um, millimeters, which is the mercury column. However, if you go up to a 20,000 meter height, it goes down to 40 millimeters there. So even if there was 100% oxygen available at such an height, it would have such low atmospheric pressure that we wouldn't be able to uh, intake the oxygen we need to leave, so we would die. Also, if you go up on really high mountains, there's uh, something that's called the boiling point that would actually decrease as you go up. Usually at one atmospheric pressure, it would be about 99.97 degrees Celsius. If you go up on a mountain, however, it would boil at 90 degrees, and if you go up even higher, it would boil at 70 degrees centigrade. If you go up to 20,000 meters, do you know how high high it would uh, boil, it would be 36.5 degrees, which is actually our body temperature. If there is no atmospheric pressure, then humans would just like blow up like a balloon and explode. And uh, being outside of the atmosphere, uh, atmospheric earth pressure would be just like that. Some people refer to um, the sun and express their gratitude for you know all of the great things it does for us humans. However, the only thing we really get from the sun, is, or some of the things we get from the sun, are like ultraviolet rays and ter terrible things that are actually bad for us. <laughs> However, there's something that's called the, uh, the Van Allen radiation belt that's like a dominant shape thing that helps uh, protect us. There's also the ozone layer that uh, prevents uh, extreme amounts of ultraviolet rays coming into the Earth's atmosphere as well. So in order for humans to be able to live in this type, to live at all, you can see how the Earth was specifically designed to make that possible. It's just like an incubator for a premature baby in that sense. Therefore, you can know that the Creator God is uh, definitely there, but there's some scientists who didn't b believe that. There's one human principle of outer space that a scientist has come up with, and what they say is, they say, it only seems plausible that outer space has been adjusted to allow humans to live. Outer space has a will and is working so that it is easy for humans to live. Therefore, if humans are not thankful to outer space, then outer space will be sad. <laughs> this is what the scientists have come up with, the leading scientists anyway. And it seems that just as, you know, advanced as science gets, they actually become more religious. Of course, you know, uh, outer space doesn't have feelings. However, the God that made earth and heaven and everything is uh, the one who has created it in a manner that is appropriate for us to live. So for young children and babies, they really have to have a perfect uh, environment to live. Otherwise, they will die because they're so fragile. In the same way, we are in God's hands, and God creates a perfect uh, uh, earth for us to be able to live. In today's passage, looking at verse 15, it says, um, you know, how uh, it's talking about a mother here. And, of course, in the Bible, it refers to God as being Father God or Heavenly Father. And it's referred to in the masculine form and not in the feminine form. However, 
you can see how this is expressing Father God's motherly affection. Of course, men can't become mothers, but they can uh, feel the same type of feelings toward their children as uh, and, and have that same type of um, parental affection. In the same way, when God looks at us as his children, he feels that. On an NHK special program that was aired a while back, there was a person by the name of Noguchi, and he was an adoptive parent, and the TV crew went into film about his uh, family. He had already adopted uh, two boys into his family, and it was a really good family atmosphere, and they were doing great. Then the Noguchi family decided that after taking in two boys, then next they would like to take in a girl instead. So they went to the facility, and they uh, were looking for a girl to adopt. They found a girl who was about four or five years old. She was uh, very well behaved and seemed smart, and she was able to you know, greet uh, people appropriately. And so they thought, oh, she would be a good match. Her name was Yukimi. So they took her in as an adoptive daughter, and she was just what they expected. She helped out a lot around the home, and she was very honest and very sweet. The Noguchi family was really you know, excited that she you knows she had come to live with them and very happy about this. However, when she was about to enter, and just about to enter elementary school, she just started acting like a baby again. She had been fine so far, you know, drinking out of a cup, uh, you know, drinking milk, juice or milk out of a cup. But then she was like, no, I want to drink out of a baby bottle. And she just like started drinking out of this baby bottle all of a sudden. And when she was going to sleep, then there's other things that were just like, she was acting like a baby and she wanted to have diapers on and everything. Her mother was, you know, very, you know, embarrassed and had to go buy diapers more outside the city because she was so embarrassed about it. And she started th sucking on her thumbs, and, you know, it was just it was totally embarrassing to the parents. They were just like, what in the world's going on? What they were most concerned about was that when the, do when the mom was sitting down doing, like, weaving um, or her th the daughter would come up and just, you know, um, you know, lay on her back and, you know, this would be cute if it was like a really little girl, but, you know, she was so big because she was already in elementary school and, you know, she would tell, you know, her to stop it and she would just come down. However, then she would come back on the opposite side of her mom's back and she would say, you can me please stop it? And she'd say, okay. And then she'd go back down and then go on the other side. And she would do this like 70 or 80 times a day. So the mother was just, you know, in pain because her shoulders were so sore. And she was really upset about this. She's like, what in the world happened to this girl? What they did is they were filming this for the TV uh, program. So they took this uh, to an expert and had him kind of tried to figure out what's going on and he was figuring out that she was like reenacting how had she had been born like a child is being born and in that way it was trying to express that and so she, they were asking him asking the parents you know has anything changed recently in her life and they're like well yeah recently she's asked a lot of questions she she, even though she knows she's come here as an adoptive daughter, she keeps saying to her mom, you know, I've been, I've, I was born of you, right? I was born of you. And she keeps just asking about that. So this uh, specialist person said, well, it's likely that Yukimi is just like trying to be a baby again. And so just kind of let her, just kind of go with it. And so that's what they did. There was a one one day when the father was putting, uh, you know, a drink in the baby bottle for her, and she was, and Yukimi is like, "What are you saying to me? I'm already in elementary school. I can't drink out of that anymore." And all of a sudden, just like all this baby attitude just ended. 
it's likely that she was just kind of testing her adoptive parents to see that, you know, if regardless of, you know, how many bad things she did, whether her parents would still love her unconditionally. As a result, she was able to realize that, yes, her parents would love her regardless, and then that finally that phase in her life just ended. In the TV program, it showed how if children don't really experience being a baby, then it will actually impact their ability to grow. It's true for us as Christians. Amongst God's amazing love, there's some of us that just still um, act as a baby and just complain about things. And we are just like testing whether God will truly love us or not. And unless we do so, we can't really grow. In today's passage, it's talking about God and how God has a motherly affection for his children. It just expresses his love in that manner. God uses these words to, uh, to, to talk about the people of Israel. And if you look at verse 14, it says, But Zion said, and Zion here are the people of Israel, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. In other words, the people of Israel were being uh, unfaithful to God and just uh, sure that God had left them alone. And that's why they were having to deal with these difficult things in their lives. So they really had a lack of faith. And God responded by saying that, you know, even if a mother forgets his uh, children, like sh God will never forget them. So this word of God is something that is something that we should just take at word. The reason why is that there's two things that can be proven because of this. The first part is uh, the truth of God's word. God doesn't lie. There's no lie anywhere in the Bible. It's because... God ha has had you know, people prophesy and tell us that his word is true. Isaiah was one of these prophets in, of about 700 B.C., and he was able to predict things that would happen nearly 100 years later. The people of Israel would be taken to Bab Babylonia, um, Babylon as uh, captives. So Babylon was then uh, taken over by Persia. And Persia and had to uh, free the people of uh, Israel, so they were allowed to go back to their home country. They then went back to Israel. And before that happened, like 130 years or so, Israel, uh, um, the prophet was able to, uh, sorry, Isaiah was able to uh, prophesy and predict that. And you can refer to that in verses 17 through 19 here. Your children hasten back, and those who laid you waste depart from you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord. You will, uh, skipping on to 19, though you were ruined and made desolate and you your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people. So, before Babylon was attacked, Jerusalem had about, you know, 250,000 people living there. And 70 years later, when they came back, uh, the uh, it in, had increased by about 200,000 people. About 70 AD, when Rome was uh, taking over and Jerusalem fell, the population w had been increased to 80, 800,000 people. So Jerusalem truly was really uh, narrow and that it couldn't accommodate so many people. And so that's why you can see how uh, Isaiah had predicted that here. 
So for 70 years, the Roman uh, army was in, in, in charge, and the people of Israel went around the world. However, they were able to reinstate their country in, in 1948. In 1967, there was the Six-Day War that took place, and Jerusalem City also was able to be uh, taken by them. The people of uh, Israel now uh, do not have their population focused in, in, in Tel Aviv or other major cities, but actually in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not uh, facing uh, the ocean, doesn't have a port or you know water source and so on. However, that's where the people are gathered, and that's because it's God's promised place in Jerusalem. There are about 900,000 people that live there now. Verse 20 says, The children born during your bereavement will yet stay in your hearing. This place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. So that's exactly what's happening right now. It's, there's just too many people there. There's too many people for that area. In history, you can know that there's places that have been destroyed and some of them have just totally disappeared off the earth. And it can be places where there's around the world where it's like there was once this great place and now there's just nothing. In history, Jerusalem has been you know, destroyed numerous times. And right after doing it, or after a while after doing it, the people have always come back. Israelites have always come back. And just as Isaiah had prophesied, the people of uh, Jerusalem are truly increasing in number to where it can't, uh, you know, hold, withhold them. God's word is true, and it will always come to pass. The second point we can realize here from this is that the truth, the truth of God's love. Looking at verse 16, it says, See, I have engraved on you the palms of my hands. And this is engraved means to like put a tattoo on. And there's, you know, young men and women who like to have tattoos on their arms or so on. And when they, you know, put their lover's name on and their lover changes, then it really causes a problem. When you put in a tattoo, it involves a lot of pain because it's like physically injuring your body. It also mentions here about the palm of your hands. And in English, it's in a, um, you know, two or more, it's in the palms, palms of hands. And it's likely that's the place that you would most likely notice about a, someone's body. And if there's something there that on your hand, then you would never forget about it. What this is meaning about is that when Jesus Christ was on the, on the cross, he expressed his love to us. On the cross, he was nailed there, and this wasn't because of his sin. It was because of our sin and that he took it upon himself in place of us. It's not that Jesus died, but three days later he was resurrected. And the disciples who were surprised about this uh, were really surprised to see him. They didn't believe it at first. However, Jesus Christ showed them the nail holes on his hands as proof. He said, this is me. This is definitely me, and he proved, proved that to them. Thereafter, Jesus Christ went back up to heaven, and and Jesus' body, he, he still has those marks of it, the nails on his hands. And this is the symbol of his love for us. I encourage you that you to remember that God is a father God who has this uh, motherly affection for his children. And just as a mother, you know, with a child in her stomach, you know, puts her hands there, she can realize just how close and important that baby is. God really loves us, and I would hope you can remember that. Today is Mother's Day, and so I really pray that each and every mother can 
you know, experience being loved by her children and, and she can express her love to them. And to realize just how great God's love is. And I really hope they can、uh, truly feel that. This is、uh, God, you know, my message for Mother's Day. May you be blessed. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to worship through the internet today on Mother's Day. We know, Lord, that you, you are always with us and you allow us to.、Um, you, you told us to today through your word how you truly feel about us and you love us. We know, Lord, that you think of us as tiny little children, tiny little babies, and that you love us、uh, with unconditional love. We're so thankful. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be able to remember the love expressed by Jesus on the cross, your love, and allow us to feel it in our hearts. We're so thankful. Allow us to have continued peace and encouragement. We know, Lord, that Jesus Christ, we can have abundant grace. May the word of Christ and the gospel spread to all people. Through Jesus' name we pay, pray. Amen. Now we'll have a time of prayer and silence.
and I'll pay once more. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.